or welcome to the latest in public health research, our research seminar uh, for the School of Public Health. I'm Jen Ahern, our Associate Dean for Research. Um, and if you are taking this for credit, um, please remember to sign in on the sheet uh, that Lauren's put into the chat for you. Um, and I'm just sort of stalling as all of you get connected to audio and such. Um, but I'm really excited about our talk today. Um, this is gonna be a presentation on a collaborative research project that involves uh, Brown University, New York University, um, and UC Berkeley. And it's led by Brandon Marshall at Brown and Magda Serda uh, at NYU. The two of them are uh, the co-multiple PIs of the research project. Uh, and this is a randomized controlled trial in which uh, that we call Provident, in which we're leveraging predictive analytics um, to target overdose prevention resources um, in Rhode Island. Um, and so for the talk today, we have a whole team uh, to present this work. Um, and one of the, I think the really cool things about this project is how it spans so many different um, skills from you know, the quantitatively technical to the community engaged. It's got just a little bit of everything um, and uh, is hopefully uh, a really sort of interesting way to engage a whole range of uh, different approaches to come up with an, a novel and hopefully effective intervention. Um, so today we have um, three, uh, main speakers, and I'll be around to help with the Q&A and um, to address anything that comes up that I can speak to. Um, but we have Bennett Allen, who's a research scientist at the Center for Opioid Epidemiology and Policy, and that's uh, in the Department of Population Health at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, we have, speaking for Berkeley, our very own Bobby Shell. Um, he's a PhD candidate in the Division of Health Policy um, and is obviously part of the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. And we have Jesse Yadanik Gray. Um, she has several roles at Brown University, including Assistant Professor of Practice in the Department of Epi at Brown University School of Public Health, as well as Assistant Dean of Education in the Office of Education and Student Services. So we have a whole team to present this very multidisciplinary work. I'm really excited for you all to see this. Um, and Jesse will be starting us off. So I'll hand it over to her. Thank you, Jen. Let me share my screen real quick here. All right. Let's get my little Zoom laptop set up doing OK. All right, can everyone see that? Is it looking like a good size? All right. So what we're doing today is sharing some of our early lessons from Provident and really talking about phases one and two of this, um, of this large community trial to give you some sense of like the actual like workings of how it is that you get this giant thing off the ground. Um, whoops. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about Rhode Island and why we picked Rhode Island for this study. And then Bobby will take us through our modeling process Bennett will talk about our community partner tools, including our really exciting Provident web tool. And then I will finish us off with some discussion about study engagement and retention. So I am a part of the People, Place and Health Collective at Brown University. That's our research collective where we do all of our studies with the community. It's all kind of started in Rhode Island and we kind of launch it from there to have national and international impact. But Rhode Island is an incredible place to do research. Um, I'm sure not many of you have been there unless you're a native East Coast person, but it is a giant 39 miles long and, um, and not that wide. And we're right on the coastal community, uh, about an hour, hour and a half south of Boston. So it's a really great place to do research and to do data sharing and partnerships because we have one health department across the whole state with no county health departments. We have um, one kind of large intertwined data system through the health and human services system. So all of the data are connected and you only need like one data use agreement to get access to quite a bit of it. And then the relationships and the community partnerships are fairly stable. So the organizations that are there, there's not a lot of them and they are pretty consistent over the years. 
So we've been able to do some really interesting projects by engaging with this community and then seeing how it lands in other parts of the country as well. <clears throat> Much of our work at the People, Place and Health Collective is done around you know, substance use, drug, uh, drug use, harm reduction, and in particular, the response to the overdose crisis in Rhode Island. Rhode Island has been at the top of the country in terms of rates of overdose per, um, per capita. And starting in around 2013, 2014, we saw the emergence of fentanyl, which is an extremely potent opioid coming into our system, into our drug supply. So that means that heroin became less common and fentanyl became more and more of the share of the drug supply. And you can see how from we started working in the community around like 2013 when they had their first big jump in overdoses and have continued to work with them strategically. But in recent years, and particularly since COVID um, came back and fentanyl also came back even stronger in 2019, 2020, we saw another huge increase in drug overdoses. So what we've been doing has been important and impactful, but it's still not enough. We also know that overdoses have occurred in all of 30, all 39 of Rhode Island's cities and towns, meaning this is a statewide crisis that has only been exacerbated since COVID and um, all the related issues that came with COVID as well regarding housing insecurity, access to care, everything. Another reason why we've been working with the community is because there is on the horizon a need for new ways of absorbing in funding streams. And one of the big funding streams that will be coming into the harm reduction community um, and the opioid response efforts are, are these settlement dollars. And we're really looking to help organizations use those settlement dollars in a way that is data-driven and, um, and really kind of helps to get ahead of the curve when they have this incredible opportunity to um, you know, infuse more resources into the community. So our study objectives, we launched this study um, just over a year ago, but our study objectives are basically to develop and validate Provident, a forecasting model to predict which neighborhoods are at highest risk for overdose death, for future overdose death. So really trying to get ahead of where the surveillance data will take us by predicting that out um, up to six months if possible. And then second, the um, community randomized trial where we can compare intervention towns who are using the provident predictions to the control towns where they are using traditional, you know, Department of Health surveillance tools and seeing, you know, are we able to achieve any leverage with these new tools in our pockets. So we're going to hand it off to Bobby, who is going to talk about our modeling process. Great, thanks, Jesse. So, of course, it's a modeling study at its core, so we don't really have a trial if we don't have a model. Uh, so, I'll detail some of the challenges that come with that. You know, I think in the classroom and in research, it's often easy to focus on just the accuracy of a model. But when we're trying to deploy this for, you know, public health utility, there's some more complexities of that, engaging stakeholders and making sure that the model is doing exactly what public health practitioners want it to do so that they actually use it. I could go to the next slide. So yeah, we've developed this model. It's a predictive analytic model. And the goal is to identify the neighborhoods that are hot spots, is what we call them, but that basically means the ones that are at highest risk of future overdose deaths. Uh, neighborhoods here, we're using census block group classifications, which is you know, roughly 4,000 people per census block group. It's been shown in the past to be a good proxy for neighborhoods. Uh, Rhode Island has 809 of those in 39 municipalities, which should be towns and cities. And we're predicting on a six month time scale because that's sort of when the data becomes available. And so the model outcome is just the incident location of overdose deaths, and we're using the Suter's uh, surveillance system to do that. Uh, there are a few different domains of predictors that we have. One of them is emergency medical service data which is basically the, the EMS reports uh, suspected overdose uh, overdose cases, and we can use those at the neighborhood level. Uh, so that's a particularly important uh, predictor. Uh, we also have prescription drug monitoring programs where we have things like uh, how many different opioid prescriptions are uh, given at neighborhood level, the strength of those prescriptions, whether benzodiazepine is uh, given with those, 
which can um, you know increase the risk of overdose death. And then we have publicly available data. So we have the American Community Service a survey, which is an effort from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, that basically contains pretty much anything you can think of in terms of social and economic indicators at the household level. And we also have a lot of a sort of land use and community resource indicators. So that would be, you know, licensed hospitals in an area or libraries or these sorts of things that we could think of that might you know, mitigate the risk of overdose death. And so there's a few different challenges that I alluded to at the beginning um, when it comes to building this sort of model. Uh, one of the big ones is that if we just use a model that most accurately identified census block groups at highest risk of overdose death, most likely we would, and if you might not know about Rhode Island, but this Providence is far and away the largest area. So most likely we would end up targeting just a bunch of different places within the main city. Uh, that doesn't really work very well if we're trying to make a public health model that actually lets us predict overdose deaths across the state and lets us distribute resources across the state. And so what we came up with, and this was uh, in collaboration with our public health practitioner partners, was this slightly constrained model where instead of just uh, allocating resources to the highest predicted uh, risk or uh, census block groups, we decided instead to focus on at least one of the highest risk census census block groups within each of the 39 municipalities. And this way we could balance sort of equity in terms of geographic areas receiving resources with the uh, performance of the model. Uh, another challenge we had is that you know, mo most of the previous literature that uses sort of machine learning predict prediction relies on individual patient level characteristics where they found things like past substance use disorder and uh, you know, prescription characteristics as being really important to uh, identify future risk of overdose and death. Uh, but, but because we're focused at a neighborhood level and we have all these more distal predictors, you know, we have nothing at the individual level. Uh, it's much more challenging because we basically don't have the central predictors that, you know, tell us when an individual person is likely to have an experience an overdose event. Uh, and lastly, the fact that we're focused on overdose deaths is itself a challenge because deaths, as you could imagine, are still a relatively rare outcome. And they're a function both of experiencing an overdose and other factors, such as the overdose prevention resources in an area and you know, how much fentanyl is in the drug supply and things of that nature. And so just to get um, a bit more involved, this is sort of where uh, the predictive model differs a lot you know, in theory and in research than it does in public health utility. Uh, there's also this broader equity consideration that we had, which is, you know, we can't really use a model to tell us if something is equitable or not. It's really a normative judgment. Um, and basically the idea is, you know, a model could perform well overall, but if it's disadvantaging certain groups of people or certain geographical areas, um, you know, it could actually make the situation worse in different pockets of Rhode Island. And that would, of course, be of a public health disaster to be implementing an intervention and making things worse. And so we had to think about what, how exactly we would define fairness uh, in this kind of model and what's like an equitable distribution of resources. And there's a, an added difficulty here, uh, you know, just deciding what's fair. Uh, in Rhode Island, there's sort of this uh, rural and suburban area around the urban area that's largely white and the urban areas that are more uh, racially diverse. And so effectively what we decided in terms of which segments of the population we're ensuring fairness between was to look at the rural urban divide in terms of what census block groups are being targeted as well as within our rural areas we focused on um, you know the targeting of lower income areas and higher income areas between each other and in urban areas we looked at how well targeted uh, majority white populations were uh, majority non-white neighborhoods were as well as integrated neighborhoods were And yeah, so we tried to build this model to maximize uh, our ability to target uh, overdose deaths, uh, but with these really important constraints applied that are sort of atypical in the larger literature. Uh, we had, we developed this target with, um, you know, the Rhode Island Department of Health, but effectively we decided that the target was to prevent or to be able to target 40% of overdose deaths across 20% of predicted neighborhoods with the slightly constrained model. And just briefly, the model that we ended up using was an ensemble approach. So it was these tree-based methods, as well as spatiotemporal models, 
uh, with all the available data that we had. Um, we ran a ton of models, which we could get into, but it's not really the focus of this presentation to try to arrive at sort of maximum predictive ability. And the way this worked is basically that the NYU team would develop completely independent methods to what we were developing. And then we would meet uh, once every few months and talk about you know what we've learned from it, what seems to be performing well, what's not performing well, and we then we eventually, you know, an ensemble approach basically means we combined the uh, both approaches to create the best prediction possible. And yeah, so obviously our, our goal was 40% of uh, overdoses predicted. Um, we did achieve that, um, targeting 20% of neighborhoods in that lightly constrained model. Uh, we achieved this target performance in these sort of lead up testing periods, basically these periods that were before the trial actually started, but for which we weren't um, training the model on. And uh, throughout the course of the randomized trial, we'll continue to update the model predictions and validate the performance as, you know, basically new six months uh, data intervals become available. And so just a quick update on the validation. We found that um, using the June to December 2020 data that our model actually predicted 42% of overdose deaths. And so what we found is actually that the model is performing better as time goes on, which might make sense because it has access to more data. Uh, and during the second validation period, which is the first six months of 2021, our model performed even better, uh, identifying almost 46% of overdose deaths. And this, like I said, suggests that the model is beginning to perform better as uh, additional time periods are added. And yeah, just to, to get into the complexity of building this model briefly, you know, we, we first had to get access to all these sorts of different data sets, which the Proud team really focused on. We had to actually build the model and the predictions. But even beyond that, then we had to find a way to present the predictions in a, an interpretable way so that the stakeholders that we're engaging actually use the model, uh, which is something we'll get into next. And there were a lot of questions you know, that just came sort of back and forward. Uh, a lot of these kind of machine learning techniques aren't really very um, easily interpreted if you're not in that space. So it kind of a lot of, you know, what does the model mean? What is it identifying? What sorts of um, predictive variables is it identifying as important? Do they match with the sorts of variables that people think are important? Um, you know, and that just kind of led to us improving the model, improving the interpretability of the model and creating, you know, maps that are sort of interpretable so that people could actually use it, you know. And just to give you a little bit more about that, Ben, I will now talk about uh, building the community partner tools, which is a really invaluable part of making sure people use it. Sure. Thanks very much, um, Bobby and, and Jesse. So I'll be, um, Ben and Alan will be sharing now. Uh, what we're doing with the model um, that Bobby just described um, and how we're using it to inform public health practice. Um, so uh, as uh, we've been discussing, we're using the model as part of the larger Provident randomized trial. So conducting the trial uh, because really we're uncertain um, whether it's more effective uh, to reduce overdose deaths at a population level, um, to allocate public health interventions, uh, sort of using practice as usual, um, or, or historical overdose surveillance data, um, which is the standard practice in most jurisdictions, as, as well as Rhode Island, or an approach using predictive analytics to forecast future area level overdose risk and proactively allocate resources accordingly or reshuffle resources accordingly. Um, so we wanted to do a deep dive into what our neighborhoods look like um, and think around how for, for the providers using these, these tools and allocating these resources, um, you know, how they can and most effectively do that. Um, so we really, that's the crux of the trial. Um, there's an emphasis, I think, uh, here on harm reduction approaches or thinking around what kind of interventions can be targeted. So these are uh, providers on the ground it's a, a range of syringe service programs, drug treatment programs, uh, community-based organizations really doing this work on the ground. So sort of what types of interventions can they, can they reshuffle um, in that context? So thinking around naloxone or the opioid uh, overdose antidote medication um, and the distribution of that at the neighborhood level, um, you know, mobile syringe service programs. So there's both static site. These organizations have 
uh, you know, static site syringe programs as well as mobile distribution. So sort of reallocating those um, and then street outreach. So really that's uh, provider boots on the ground to engage, engage folks in care and whatever that care looks like uh, for them um, as well as community capacity building activities. So thinking around things like uh, coalition building or community engagement, uh, community development work um, and where in a, in a city should that occur um, you know, to, to most most immediately impact overdose deaths. Next slide, please. Um, so really, this is fundamentally a test of public health resource allocation um, is, is sort of one way of thinking about what we're doing here. Um, so here you see um, the allocation of the 39 municipalities in Rhode Island, so cities or towns in Rhode Island, randomized to one of the two trial arms. Um, so I'm actually part of the modeling team, so I'm also blinded to whether arm A or B or the treatment or control, but you can see there, there are two arms um, there, and that's the, the distribution of them in the trial. Um, so some cities in Rhode Island have been randomized to receive the, the model prediction. So in those uh, you know, communities, research staff are really working with stakeholders to deliver these interventions um, and, and thinking around where, where, where to do that. And I think, I think what's important to note is that in both conditions, the providers are receiving the same allotment of resources that they would have normally. So it's not that the treatment group is receiving more resources, it's that they're receiving uh, different information about what to do with those resources. Um, so here we see you know, in the control condition, both in, in both arms, um, providers are receiving support from the Rhode Island Department of Health, as well as the research team at Brown, um, Jesse's team, uh, to receive you know, support to receive and interpret descriptive overdose data from the state and access to um, the Rhode Island Department of Health maintains you know, very robust overdose surveillance. So having that information as well, um, including some data reports that, that Rhode Island Department of Health and their team at Brown prepare. Um, both arms also are receiving maps um, uh, to, to in, in, in sort of make this information more accessible to providers and showcase where resources and, and the burden of overdoses across the state, as well as access to a, a suite of web services um, that the, the team at Brown has prepared um, a really fantastic suite of web services. But what's different on the next slide um, is that the folks in the treatment arm are also receiving information from the model predictions from what the model that Bobby presented um, sort of where uh, are we predicting in the, those neighborhoods, that top 20% of, of neighborhoods across the state, um, you know, where are our future overdose deaths uh, likely to occur? Um, so this is really the crux of the trial is does informing those providers about where to allocate the resources proactively or where they might like to allocate the resources proactively, um, does that have any impact on overdose mortality at the population level? And I think also it's important to highlight that the intervention here is really providing the, the providing the information to the providers. Um, there's not a prescriptive uh, reallocation of resources or, or sort of um, you know sort of uh, uh, forcing them to reallocate the resources in any way. It really does informing them about this 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 hotspotting method really uh, makes sense in terms of, of reducing mortality. Next slide, please. Um, so here, we th I, I think important to highlight is the, the Provident web tool, and this is really an exciting piece of it um, that Jesse's team prepared uh, is, 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 is such a cool such a cool feature. So it's a secure web tool that all the Provident uh, participating providers have received access to, um, and, and it's a sort of a, a nice suite of of information um, that they could access remotely or sort of in the field uh, in their organizations. Um, that includes both information about the trial itself um, and then for the providers who are, are, are in the treatment arm, the predictions, as well as a sort of comprehensive deep dive into their neighborhoods, um, you know, the, the neighborhoods in which they're working, um, as well as the state if they were interested. Um, so sort of organizations can, can sort of really use this to help inform their service delivery, uh, regardless of which arm they're in. Um, but then again, the treatment arm is they're receiving additionally the predictions. Um, organizations that are participating in the trial are also asked to submit neighborhood assessment forms through the tool. So really uh, sort of process evaluation measures to think around how are they using the tool? How are they engaging with their community? How are they delivering services? So sort of those, those key uh, pieces of information to think about this really as a public health intervention um, as much as it is a research study. Next slide, please. So this is what the web tool looks like. This is just one example, one snippet of from Providence. Um, so you can see there is Providence Metro. Um, so there is the, the, the municipality of Providence. Um, and then on the, on the inlay, there are the census block groups or neighborhoods 
uh, within the city. So you can see those are our, our outline there. Um, and then for the entire for the entire town, as well as uh, the, within the block groups, we provide, um, you can see on the right, uh, a, a whole host of information sort of around community characteristics of the racial and ethnic composition of the neighborhood, as well as what we're calling social vulnerability indicators. Um, so thinking around poverty status, unemployment, you can see rent burden, the housing, housing um, vulnerability, um, both for the block group itself and and then for providers to be able to look at for their neighborhood, what's my neighborhood like relative to the town? So relative to Providence uh, that, we're, that we're situated in, um, as well as relative to the state. So for all the towns and all the neighborhoods across Rhode Island, um, this information is available for them to, to use and to inform their work. Um, so I think there's a really crucial, crucial piece of this. Next slide, please. So here um, you can see when, so when they click through on the web tool, they, they receive an inlay, uh, quick click on those inlays, they receive a zoom in to the neighborhood or to the census block group that they're, that they're working in. So these dots here indicate a uh, high traffic activity in a given, in a given neighborhood. Um, and the way these are, are derived, and I think this is very exciting, is uh, from a receipt of anonymous and scrubbed cell phone location data. Um, uh, to indicate where are sort of high traffic areas in a given neighborhood. Um, and this is really can be used to inform street outreach um, and, and, and sort of uh, distribution of resources in a given neighborhood um, to help, help these providers make sense of, of where they should be uh, allocating their efforts. Um, and in particular, this is really, I think, very crucial. I think it might, um, you know, in an urban context or somewhere like New York City or Berkeley, California, like, um, you know, this information uh, you know, P providers might say, oh, we know already, but in a suburban or rural context like Rhode Island and many of the towns there, this is really crucial information to think about where should I, you know, as a provider be conducting street outreach in a rural or suburban context. Uh, it's really difficult to make those decisions. So this type of information with uh, being able to identify where are sort of key hubs in the community um, is really crucial. And I think it's important to note that this is also one of the most popular features um, of the web tool. So really an exciting, an exciting piece of this. Next slide, please. Um, so here you can see the web tool activity. So this is as of August of this year, um, and this shows the participating organizations. Um, here's three of the participating organizations. Um, it shows the, the, their web tool activity and their usage month to month. So you can see, for example, the bottom is an organization called Project Weber Renew or PWR. So you can see that in November, 2021, they accessed the 128 times the web tool, clicked through the, clicked through the map as well as um, you know, on the, on the bottom of lesser amount zooming into the neighborhoods, then their increase, uh, their use increased and then has uh, uh, tapered somewhat. But I think it really sort of allows us as uh, the research team to really think through how can we engage and keep providers engaged um, in, in the using these resources to inform their work. Next slide, please. And then again, just a, another sort of last piece of information that we're capturing for all the providers is the form activity. So this is those process evaluation measures that I mentioned. So this, this tracks for all the participating organizations, uh, how uh, engaged sort of in, in, in providing that feedback to us that they are. Um, so it allows us to think, really think about who's using the web tool and then what's different about those organizations that's using the, that are using the tools and, and providing more robust feedback. Um, so now I'll hand it back to, to Jesse to, wrap us up with the talking about study engagement and retention. So. Thank you, Bennett. All right. So as you could see from those last two slides, um, sorry, the sun is coming in, blinding me. Um, as you could see from the last two slides, we do have some issues with getting folks to use the tool on a monthly basis. So um, we do want to highlight that these are folks these partner organizations, we started out with four, they do have an annual paid contract for their staff time, and they do participate in focus groups to give us feedback on the tool, and we can update the tool accordingly. So the first month in November, where you could like zoom to the neighborhood, is where we were given some feedback about how difficult it was to zoom, and so we made some adjustments, and you saw an increase in people's ability to zoom to the neighborhood more often. Um, so we do pay them for their time on an annual basis. We also, um, you know, listen to feedback as much as they'll give it to us. And then the other part of our engagement and retention plan has been to do what we call the Provident Data Academies. Now, when you're working with community partners whose primary, um, 
you know, purpose is to provide case management and straight outreach. You're not working with a lot of folks who have formal training in, you know, data surveillance activities, statistics, and public health, like epidemiology terms and things like that. You're working with folks who are largely like peers in recovery, um, people who are social workers by training and, you know, and then also just a lot of, you know, just community folks who just are, are not interested. They're not used, they don't necessarily need to use these data for their day-to-day -day work. What we're trying to do is get them to engage and plan out some of this work in a bigger way so that we can kind of get ahead of the curve with those six month predictions. So getting organizations to use data as well as plan out for six months when their primary mode of operation is relying on feedback from their participants on the day-to-day -day basis, um, word of mouth, as well as like day-to-day -day planning and crisis, it's very different uh, way to operate. So what we do is we, set it up so that we have an initial workshop with um, monthly check-ins every month thereafter. So our big focus for the monthly workshops is um, to talk about data storytelling because storytelling is such an incredible part of the, um, you know, the approach to harm reduction and to engaging people in recovery from substance use um, disorders. What we want to kind of build on is that rich context of data storing and how data storytelling, how you can take people's individual experiences and add data in to kind of broaden your reach to a different audience, including policymakers and funders. A, a key piece of that is also knowing your audience and how to curate your message to really reach the right audience. We also have a tip that we train on called the bite snack meal approach, where we you know, teach folks how to really, um, you know, break up their message based on who their audience is. And I'll go over that in a slide in just a minute. We have a lot of one pagers, which are what we call just like plain language reference guides that are essentially one page front and back that really describe all of our work in terms. And we have a glossary so that um, some of this language feels more accessible and we walk through it a lot more carefully for a broader audience. And then our workshops are very engaging. So we have a lot of activities to illustrate, you know, basic epidemiological concepts like counts, rates, percentages, incident rates, um, all of those types of terms that have been very common since COVID, but, um, but maybe are not as uh, user friendly as we had hoped. So we're really working on just kind of integrating these concepts more clearly and walking folks through them. And then finally, we really wanna increase people's confidence with the maps and planning tools. So we're very responsive to the feedback. And we talk a lot about the history of redlining and how that impacts and shapes a neighborhood as well. So we've got a lot of in, you know, engaging activities, breakout groups, quizzes, things like that to keep it you know, interesting. But even with all of these, you know, really engaging activities. We, we pay folks, we get them to attend focus groups. We also know that engagement in a study has to come back to the why. So why are we doing this? Why, are, why should they keep showing up to these activities? And a big part of that is um, research is better with all of us. So Rhode Island, we have to continuously stress that Rhode Island has been a model in the fight for overdose. We have all of the things set up to make us successful. We have integrated data systems. We have beautiful public dashboards. We have you know, a lot of community participation and leadership. And at the same time, overdoses are still going up. So there's still something missing here and we still need to do more. And I think that is the piece that really brings people back to the table. So this is where we introduce the purpose of our new tool. We need to figure out if this will work and what can help us get one step ahead of the overdose crisis. Because right now surveillance tools really aren't giving us the you know, leverage we need to get ahead. And I think people really like, can grab onto that and think about that as something useful. So that really puts this study into context for a lot of our community partners. This is an example of our one pager of um, what the trial is, as well as what is a randomized control trial. And, you know, we, we try to use clear language that is written at an accessible reading level and images that are easy to kind of grasp. We also 
focus on the concepts of health literacy and data literacy. So a lot of folks understand the concept of health literacy. It's inherent to the jobs of outreach workers in that people need to have the ability to process and understand health information to get their, to make their own decisions about their health. And data literacy, we kind of take it one step further and that we want folks to understand public health data in order to guide program and policy level decisions. So that data literacy is really built for the organizations and that this can really help them um, make the decisions they need about their programming and their funding. The bite snack meal approach is a big tool in um, cutting down on information overload. So what we do a lot is train folks to kind of lean into this thing we call the bite or the headline of the story. Because really, you know, our, our community partners, they're really like the community influencers. So they're really hearing all of this information and this data directly from our research team, directly from the Department of Health. And it's in this full meal format of getting way too much information. But what they really need in order to act on it is really something more like a snack, like an abstract of like what's going on, or if they're communicating with their communities, um, they might even want to just stick to the headlines of the information. So they don't, so we try to really normalize that you don't need to be an expert in all of these methods, but you are really important to conveying this message and distilling it down for our audiences. And that means making a lot of decisions around cutting content and focusing on what is the most important piece of it all. And um, finally, we do try to tease out um, how to talk about disparities, because that is a huge part of the story that you can't get just when you're hearing personal narratives or relying on themes that you hear on your outreach routes. So we always ask them to identify how a story is being told, having a critical eye on whether things are being told through personal stories only, or are people pairing it with counts? I'm sorry, can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, so counts, rates, and percentages being other tools that you can use to tell a story and convey the size and the scope and the you know, meaning of an issue. And then looking at disparities, that's where we get into um, rates, or the rates are really an important part of highlighting disparities. And so that's where we ask folks to really start to learn the purpose and utility of some of these you know, more advanced epidemiological methods? And then is there more to the story that they need to help guide decisions and action? So how do you take that data and really push it toward action? That's the whole um, kind of driving force behind learning all of this new content. And then we have class activities that really engage with the web tools. So really getting folks to feel comfortable zooming in, zooming out, creating plans in this tool. It is a little bit more data entry, but we've we estimate it to be about one hour a month for data entry, plus engaging in about one activity a month with us. And then when there's a, when there's a uh, data refresh, meaning that the predictions are going to change because we're updating the model, we do a more in-depth workshop where we talk about what those changes look like and kind of see what their thoughts are with the new predictions. Um, so that's, that's in general, some of the activities that we're doing plus the bigger messages that we're conveying to our, our partners to make sure that they stay engaged. It's still a struggle, but I think that we have um, really identified different case studies and use study use cases for how people are engaging with the tool and what is the you know, most meaningful way that they're engaging with it. And so we're really grateful for our community partners and um, always exciting to work with cross country collaborators as well. Um, so that's, that's ultimately all of our information and all of our slides for today. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you all so much for that really amazing talk. I learned so much and it's really great that you're doing. Um, let me open it up now and see if people have questions. Um, if you wanna either unmute and ask a question or put a question in chat, either one. Hi, this is Coco Auerswald. Um, I'm a faculty member at the School of Public Health and I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for this really groundbreaking work. Um, 
I'm wondering if uh, there are ways in which uh, people have used uh, these data or are planning to use these data for uh, advocacy efforts like writing op-eds or uh, pushing for specific legislation or things like that. And thanks again for a fantastic presentation. Um, I can speak to Rhode Island. Yes, definitely folks are using the data. Um, we do have the caveat that uh, this is still under research, but we've recently been pushing for supervised consumption sites as an intervention to the overdose crisis. And that is where they've been able to rely on, you know, some of the location data that we can provide, um, showing that, you know, these are areas that are of concern and um, could use more intervention. I think that's the most recent example. And folks have also been using it for funding, uh, but it's pretty localized because of the intervention um, and control arms that not everyone can use it statewide. So that's, I think, a barrier right now. Bennett, did you have any other examples that you wanted to share? Um, I think the the supervised consumption is really where I see um, folks like sort of being able to take the data skills that you uh, are offering, Jesse and your team in the data academy and sort of that data literacy and health literacy, like you said, I think we're seeing a lot of that um, from the community providers in Rhode Island. There was a New York Times uh, piece that came out recently um, highlighting their efforts. Uh, I think it was really exciting to see. So. Great, great, thank you. Um, Charlotte has a question. She's just wondering if she, if you can tell, say a little more about the time, space, geospatial components as inputs to the model. Bobby, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, I thought we did. We didn't really do geospatial models as much. We did. Uh, we basically tried a bunch of different. Uh, machine learning algorithms. So we were trying random forest, gradient boosting machines, elastic net, we were screening, we were doing a bunch of different, basically we were like trying everything that we could to see what could raise performance, you know, it's just particularly challenging, given that it's such a rare outcome. And so, so interestingly enough, um, uh, I think you found this too, Bennett, that the gradient boosting machine just seemed to perform really well. So, so one of the takeaways was despite all these sophisticated attempts at modeling that we had, we uh, we found that sort of, you know, ready-made algorithms actually performed similarly well. That's just how modeling goes. And I'll, I'll just add, like, I think around the, what we found was interesting, I think around the modeling was um, the, the sort of temporal component of it where we're working in six month intervals for predictions and sort of that was guided by public health in terms of that's the the sort of shortest amount of time that they felt at the Rhode Island Department of Health that they could actually realistically or nimbly reallocate resources. So that was, I think, an important uh, consideration. And that was the sort of choice of our, our time frame there. Um, and then in terms of the actual modeling, we ended up implementing the model in what we're calling a moving window approach. So sort of using uh, rolling across time from sort of, sort of, uh, you know, sort of using the our target and then target minus one period minus two periods and then rolling that forward across the whole data set so that that was for us you know as bobby said we tried really the whole kitchen sink essentially um you know sort of all the spaghetti on the wall and then that was what worked best for us for the for the trial so and i'll just add in terms of and they'll correct me if i'm wrong because i feel like it was forever ago that we built the model but i think um, of all the predictor data, some of which was harder to get and some of which was easier to get, the EMS data was the one that most substantially improved our performance over what we could do with ACS. Does that sound right, modeling team? So right, and even said, the EMS data alone performed pretty well. So in terms of where to put your effort in accessing data, that was uh, had a lot of impact. Great, thank you. Other questions people have? Oh, Charlotte, go ahead, did you have a follow-up? Hi, so if nobody's asking, then I'll ask another one. So I just wanna make sure I understood correctly that you created your own SVI, you didn't use like CDC's SVI or um, one of, 
one of the other uh, ones that are out there. You created your own. Did I catch that properly? Your your vulnerability index. You you created your own. Um, are you referring to the predictors in the model? Right, right. There was the the one table where you talked about, um, like the SDI. Right, you had the table in one of the slides, you, and you talked about. If yeah, the question's if, not clear. Don't worry about it. No, I I see what you mean. Yeah. So for the social vulnerability, what we did was I think kind of just disaggregated some of those because I think social vulnerability in terms of the census is an aggregated measure, and we found that people didn't really um, trust it the same, and so we had to kind of le you know tease it out so people understood what elements were going into that. So I think that's the other big piece of like the feedback we've been getting is like what do people trust as like an aggregated measure and like do we use that or do we break it out and we have a prior project where we did this as well it was like a pilot study essentially before provident where we tested social vulnerability against some of the more standard um measures that people trusted and and i think you know we found that people really struggled with like the basic social vulnerability composite you know Thank you. Information. Great. Well, thank you very much. Any other questions? We still have a few more minutes before we sign off. I'll just plug the New York Times article Jesse put in the yeah, link. It's you. a really exciting article. About, Great. Thanks um, so much for having that work. link. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of you for presenting your work today. Really, really appreciate you being here and sharing your work with us. And thanks to everyone for joining this um, talk today and the series. This wraps up our series for the semester. So thank you very much. Take thank care. you, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Thank you for having us.